Good afternoon. I'm Bob Gillen, the head of the Western Kansas Ag Research Centers for Kansas State University. And on behalf of all of our faculty and staff, I'd like to welcome you all to our first virtual field day at the Agricultural Research Center, Hayes. As with so many things in society, that we've had to do things a lot differently since mid-March. And rather than stack a bunch of us together on hay bales and trailers, uh, we feel like it's a little bit better this year to do this digital outreach. It'll obviously be the first time that we've ever tried this. I think it'll go smoothly. However, one thing that hasn't changed is our goal is still to work on relevant problems that producers and consultants have that they're facing today. And we want to, to try and get information into your hands as quickly as possible on the problems that we're working on and possible solutions and, again, information that you can use. Also, as I've, I've said many times in the past, we always welcome feedback uh, suggestions and questions from producers and others in the ag industry on the things that we need to be working on that can help you the most. With that, again, I appreciate the time you, you've taken to spend with us today, and now let's move on to your actual presentations. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Vipin Kumar. I'm a weed scientist at Ag Experiment Station uh, in Hayes with Kansas State University. Uh, working for last three years and uh, part of my responsibilities is to develop uh, herbicide strategies or weed control strategies for western Kansas. Uh, we have been here in the uh, in, in one of the soybean field here uh, trying to demonstrate what kind of research activities we have been doing this summer. Uh, <coughs> as most of the growers they have been experiencing more and more weed problem this year with the with the more rainfall uh, in the summer and uh, we are really trying to figure out what can be done in in the soybean uh, to keep our palmer amaranth or kochia or mare's tail under control so <coughs> one thing happened this summer was uh, also the dicamba bean uh, was also been put in a hold and we don't know the future of extend technologies uh, so considering that, uh, we like to know what other technologies are available and uh, in the soybean and that can be incorporated uh, in western Kansas or central part of state uh, in terms of uh, herbicide resistant technologies. So the field we are standing now here is, a, is a one of those technologies we have been evaluating since last two years. Uh, this is the Enlist or E3 soybean. Uh, basically, Enlist trait uh, been brought up by Corteva Agri Sciences, and it is a resistance or uh, multiple resistance to glyphosate, uh, 2,4-D, and glufosinate. Uh, there is a um, a new formulation of 2,4-D, 2,4-D choline, which you can be sprayed uh, along with glyphosate and glufosinate over the top. So this technology came last year into the market, and as most of you know, we have documented a first case of uh, 2,4-D resistance palmer amaranth in Kansas and we have a couple of population that showed low level of resistance to 2,4-D along with multiple resistance to glyphosate, HPPD inhibitors and PS2 inhibitors. So the idea of, uh, of having that issues uh, here in the state and what can be done to control that palmer amaranth if we're gonna plant these uh, enlist soybean. So we did this study last year. Uh, this is one of my graduate student project looking at uh, different herbicide strategies, including uh, newly available uh, pre-applied premixes, uh, how they um, perform in, in a no-till dryland system, especially in the western part of the uh, state as well as the central part of the state. And uh, al along with the pre-mixes, uh, if we can uh, cut down our post applications to to one application only of those in less uh, glyphosate and liberty uh, mixtures so this is the field we have been standing here and uh, uh, some of the plots uh, i will demonstrate here in in shortly uh, where we have just one time pre-applied premixes versus we where we have two pass programs uh, including pre-applied premixes then follow up with the 
in less glyphosate uh, and uh, liberty or glufosinate uh, applied mixture so uh, this is one of the technology and along with this we have uh, another uh, crop traits or soybean trade we have been evaluating is called GT27 or Liberty Link GT27. Uh, it is not commercially available yet uh, but it's going to be soon in the market. So this trait has uh, a cross resistance or multiple resistance uh, with the Liberty which is glufosinate and glyphosate along with the tolerance to isoxaflutol which is a group 27 herbicide or HPPD inhibitors. So uh, we have also been evaluating that trait here. Uh, again the idea of evaluating these trait is what kind of herbicide strategies we can go with uh, in, in the western part of the state where we are limited with the moisture and we uh, also do no tillage soybean production. Uh, what kind of herbicide uh, premixes we can use uh, in those system. So I'll, I'll go over some of the treatments we have been looking at here in, in LIS E3 soybean and then we'll jump on uh, some of the plots in GT27 soybeans. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have been evaluating in list uh, soybean. Um, some of the soybean growers have also been seeing trouble with the volunteer corn in, in soybean and especially with this trait being in soybean as well as in corn uh, we had an idea if we if the grower has enlist corn followed by enlist soybean next year and if they have enlist corn volunteers in enlist soybean what can be uh, can be used to control those volunteers corn in soybean so this is a basically a, a few treatments here we have put together looking at uh, at uh, enlist corn control in enlist soybean. Uh, one thing uh, about enlist corn is it is also resistant uh, to one of the group 1 herbicide called Kizalofop or, or FOP herbicide along with the uh, resistance to glyphosate, 2,4-D and glufosinate. So it really becomes challenging when we are using group 1 herbicides to control these uh, grasses in soybean uh, but we cannot use that FOP herbicide because this corn is already tolerant to uh, FOP herbicide. So what we had here a couple of treatment from another class of group 1 herbicides or gram graminicides uh, called DIMS and we tested two different uh, chemistries one is a select max and another is a post plus and we tested them standalone along with the enlist one because some of the growers they apply those graminicide along with their broadleaf control uh, herbicides like enlist uh, glyphosate and glufosinate so we included those uh, enlist one in tank to see if there is any antagonism or or synergism so we will show some of these plots also here uh, in a short while so here we are standing in uh, the, the study where we are looking at some uh, graminicide herbicides for controlling enlist corn in enlist soybean. And the first treatment you are seeing here is uh, basically Select Max. Uh, Select Max we applied standalone when the corn was somewhere between uh, 5 to 6 inch uh, tall. And uh, you can see pretty good control of uh, volunteer corn in this plot. Uh, as you can see some corn plants on the side uh, of the plot. So the next treatment we had here was uh, post plus which is another uh, DIMS or uh, uh, graminicide and as you can see the middle of the plot there's a couple of plants standing on the on the very last of the plot but most of the plot looks pretty clean and this was again applied at the same time when select, mes select max was applied. Uh, along with these standalone treatments, we had a third treatment here where uh, we included Select Max with Enlist 1. And you can see uh, didn't differ too much from standalone Select Max versus Select Max with 2,4-D. Pretty good looking plot uh, except one uh, corn plant standing at the, at the end of the plot. But when we had a Post uh, Plus along with Enlist 1, uh, here in this plot, we saw a little bit antagonism with Enlist 1 uh, having a post plus. You can see some plants still uh, regrow back and they are still uh, regrowing and producing uh, cobs and, and seeds. So 
uh, one take home we can take from this this treatment is uh, uh, try to uh, you know separate out the enlist one treatment from post plus treatment uh, give at least seven days interval uh, before you apply post plus and then enlist one don't tank mix uh, if you want to tank mix increase the rate of post plus uh, as per the as per the label by enlist one then you can uh, mitigate that antagonism uh, with enlist one so this is the, these are the treatments we we applied when sorghum uh, corn was you know five to six inch tall and then we had same treat set of treatments we applied here when the the corn was tall like 30 inch tall late in the season and you can see still performing pretty good this is a select max treatment you're seeing in the in the video here uh, most of the corn or volunteer corns are dead except one or two plants uh, as you can see here but mostly it, it performed well and same with the post plus here uh, late treatment when the corn was 30 inch and you can see a little bit uh, less consistent uh, we had some corn uh, plants here standing uh, growing regrowing back uh, so again emphasis should be the early season application of these graminicide if you really have a big infestation of volunteer corn in your soybean so this is this is the first year of this study and we will be repeating uh, next year and all the results uh, from these plots will be available in, as a research reports as well as uh, peer-reviewed publication. So here we are standing uh, in front of Enlist 3 soybean again uh, looking at some of the programs, herbicide programs, uh, especially newly available premixes, pre-applied premixes uh, versus a follow-up sequential treatment of Enlist, Glyphosate and Liberty. So the first treatment here I'm demonstrating is a sonic, which is a basically a two-way or a two herbicide mode of actions uh, premix, group two as well as the group 14. Um, so you can see this was applied pre-applied, and uh, there were some rain and there's some cautia kind of you can see in the plot in the middle of the plot, uh, but overall was pretty good good control right from the beginning and this is gonna be like two months two and a half months now uh, when these soybeans were planted uh, the second treatment we had here was the trivens again another premix uh, uh, most of these uh, premixes or pre-applied uh, herbicide you can see some of these uh, they have degraded and some of the weeds they have started poking up in these plots uh, but the idea of including these premixes right in the front was to reduce the the selection pressure on the post applied uh, enlist or or glyphosate or glufosinate because that's where the problem starts because if you just use the post applied uh, chemistries things like uh, enlist or glyphosate we see more and more problem uh, of resistance so this was really a, a strategy to look at some foundational program if we apply pre and how far we can go with those pre-applied. So this is a treatment of trivens again two-way uh, premix. Uh, you can see most of the palmer uh, is, is, is controlled but there are some cautia standing there in those plots. And then uh, next treatment I had was authority spream. This is a a uh, new premix of pyroxysulfon and sulfentrazone uh, also come as authority edge and uh, recently became available and we wanted to see how it does in this uh, new tr uh, trait of soybean. Uh, again there are some uh, mare's tail plants standing there and there's one palmer amaranth at, at the end of the plot but consistently giving a more than 85-90% control of palmer amaranth. Uh, with just one one shot of authority authority stream 10 ounce so the next treatment here we were looking at authority mtz which is a standard soybean program go with the sulfentrazone and uh, and metribuzin uh, you can see it was a little weak you can still see some palmer amaran standing in the plot and uh, that came probably in the, in the middle of july when we got a good amount of rainfall and their new flush of palmer amaranth came up so a not very good looking plot but uh, there was pretty good control uh, in the early in the season 
next treatment we had is uh, Panther Pro another three-way premix uh, pretty good control of Palmer amaranth as well as Kochia uh, except some mare tail uh, plants they showed up later on uh, but it was pretty good control early in the season majority of those pre applied premixes was more than 90 95 percent about for about a month or six weeks after planting so that's a good win-win uh, situation especially when soybean is kind of growing up and developing that's where you uh, need to remove those uh, weed competition with the soybean so that was pretty good uh, activities from these uh, pre-applied premixes especially in no-till dry land situation although we were having enough moisture this year to activate those premixes so next treatment uh, number six we had fierce xlt uh, again a three-way premix of uh, group twos flumioxazine and pyroxysulfone a uh, pretty good looking plot initially and we had just seen some mare's tail coming very late in the season along with the, those moisture here i really want to point out uh, on this block here uh, where we had pre-applied same programs but we had follow-up treatment of enlist one glyphosate and liberty uh, this is a two pass strategies where we have pre-applied compound chemistry and then we four, four weeks later we had over the top one post application so you can see this whole block is pretty clean uh, compared to just pre alone programs so that's the that's the strategies we need to kind of adopt so that we have herbicide with the different herbicide mode of actions into the into the system especially when we start soybean planting we should have a good foundation program and then if needed uh, you know go with the one good effective post application of uh, enlist one with the liberty as well as glyphosate so two pass strategies are really really working well this year and also last year we saw the same kind of trend uh, here in Hayes as well as in Great Penn so my student will be uh, compiling these results again in terms of uh, K KSRE research reports, annual reports, and it'll be writing a peer-reviewed publication, and will be will be available all to all the Kansas growers, uh, hopefully next summer. Thank you. Okay, so we are now standing in front of uh, one of the sorghum hybrid we have been evaluating in Western Kansas called iGrow sorghum. It's been brought up by uh, Adventa Seed, and the chemistry is provided by UPL. So this, herb, uh, this hybrid is basically tolerant to imidazolinone class of herbicide or group 2, one of the class in group 2 herbicides. Um, this hybrid is going to be available for growers next year so they can order the seed. Uh, hopefully this fall and winter they can get the seed for this hybrid on limited basis. So we have been evaluating this hybrid uh, across uh, western Kansas here in Hayes as well as in Garden City. So the idea of uh, having uh, imidazolinone or imazamox uh, herbicide over the top is uh, for grass control. As you know, we don't have any options for grass control over the top. So this is going to be a one option to go with if you have this uh, hybrid in your field and you are struggling with the grass, uh, things like barnyard grass or uh, foxtail or, or any other grasses you see in the, in the sorghum will be quite effective. We have been evaluating this hybrid from last year and been seeing pretty good consistent results on foxtail control as well as uh, some of the uh, broadleaf control like uh, puncture wine and this is also very compatible with uh, other sorghum uh, applied herbicides uh, pre as well as post herbicides. Along with this we have been evaluating here uh, on the left on the right side of me uh, is the Inzen sorghum which we have been evaluating for a number of years here another group 2 herbicide resistant sorghum and uh, this is uh, another class of group 2 which is sulfonylurea or SU resistant sorghum so the herbicide label in Inzen sorghum is going to be nicosulfuron uh, or SU herbicide and uh, we also been seeing a pretty consistent control with the nicosulfuron uh, applied standalone on, on grassy weeds for broadleaf control as well as grass control together you have to have a tank mixture of this these chemistries with uh, another 
a uh, group of herbicides, things like atrazine or asmatolachlor, if you're going to apply pre, because uh, these chemistries, group 2 herbicides, are not standalone or silver bullets for taking care of all weed control in sorghum. So these are only options for grass control and imazamox also provides some level of control to other broadleaves but not the uh, nicosulfurone. So you definitely have to uh, mix other herbicide mode of actions along with these chemistries. So we are going to have uh, good results by end of the year and I'll be talking more uh, in depth on these uh, new technology in sorghum in upcoming sorghum field day in Larned on September 2nd. That will be a virtual field day. So stay tuned for more information on these sorghum hybrids. Thank you. Um, today we're going to talk about how temperature affects insect population damages and crop losses. If you're a farmer, you know how important temperature is for just about any natural process on the farm whether it's deciding how early you can plant your corn or taking steps to ensure the comfort of your cattle during extreme weather conditions. Temperature is also a big driver of insect problems, both directly and indirectly. So today I want to review the key effects of temperature on pest problems in field crops. Many people think that a cold winter will kill a lot of insects and reduce their numbers the following spring, but it doesn't work like that. Insects have evolved many physiological and behavioral adaptations for overwintering. Physiological mechanisms typically confer some degree of cold tolerance, whereas behavioral adaptations involve some form of cold avoidance. Most arthropods overwintering in cold climates employ some combination of both. If you can burrow into the soil, you can often avoid the coldest temperatures, if you go deep enough. So many insects overwinter underground as late instar larvae or pupae within insulated silken cocoons. Now, species that overwinter as adults often migrate to overwintering sites in specific protected locations where they may form large aggregate, or aggregations, such as these convergent lady beetles in Colorado, or this related species in the Czech Republic that form smaller aggregations deep in the thatch of grassy tussocks. But the real key to success at overwintering life stages of many insects is the production of special sugars in their blood that serve as antifreeze. So they can supercool to very low temperatures without their cells being ruptured by any ice crystals. Some insects are able to supercool to minus 30 degrees centigrade for extended periods. But arthropods vary greatly in their ability to tolerate cold. You may have noticed the large Asian lady beetles trying to enter your house in the fall. This is cold avoidance behavior as they are unable to withstand freezing temperatures for any length of time. The vast majority end up taking shelter in uninsulated structures such as sheds and silos where they invariably freeze to death. So even this incredibly successful invasive species has an Achilles heel. It cannot withstand extremes of temperature. As everything warms up and comes to life in the spring, Temperature is again the primary determinant of everything that happens. Degree day models have been calculated for many pest insects to predict their peak emergence in spring. These are based on the fact that all insects have a developmental threshold temperature, below which no activity or development of any kind will occur, not specific to each species. They also have a specific rate of development that increases with temperatures above that threshold. So once you know these values, you can create a degree day model, which allows you to predict emergence in spring. All you need to know is the minimum and maximum daily temperatures, average them for each day when temperatures rise above the threshold, and then sum them over days until they reach a specific value. For example, for alfalfa weevil in Kansas, 
this value ranges from 150 to 180 degree days. It's never exact because not all individuals are the same, nor do they all experience the same temperatures. But it is useful as a guide to know when to begin scouting this pest. Springtime on the prairie is also notorious for abrupt cold snaps. These can be significantly harmful to insects that have emerged and become reproductive because they will have lost their cold tolerance. However, sudden cold snaps don't harm all insects equally, and they tend to be more harmful for beneficial species, especially those in immature stages. Because arthropods are exothermic, unable to regulate their own body temperature directly, cold temperatures constrain activity patterns. Now, this might not matter much to a herbivore sitting on its host plant. It can just hang out and wait for things to warm up. But predators and parasitoids must actively search for food in hosts, and even cold temps above freezing can inhibit their ability to do this. Summer on the prairie can actually be a more difficult time for many insects to survive than winter. Farmers will be familiar with the negative effects of heat and drought on their crops, but effects on arthropods can be just as dramatic. An insect, after all, is like a little bag of water with holes in it. Because they are small, they have a high surface area to volume ratio. This means that they lose moisture a lot faster than a larger organism will, uh, like humans. So they must either curtail their activities to diminish the rate of water loss, or have some way to replenish it. That's why you don't get bitten by mosquitoes in the heat of the day. They would dry out in minutes if they tried to fly at high temperatures. But once again, behavioral and physiological adaptations can come into play to mitigate these risks. For mosquitoes, it is hiding in the shade and rehydrating from drops of dew and flower nectar. Because herbivorous insects are feeding on plants, and plant tissues contain lots of water, most crop pests can usually meet their water needs quite easily from their food. But high temperatures can still be limiting. For example, aphids prefer cooler temperatures, and their numbers can be dramatically reduced by hot temperatures alone. One reason we never had much of a problem with soybean aphid in Kansas, our summer temperatures are usually too hot for them. They can barely survive on lower leaves deep in the canopy where it's cooler. But these leaves are not nutritious enough to support much reproduction. However, beneficial insects are once again more at risk at high temperatures because they need to be far more active to find their food, even though they can also utilize plants for rehydration. Here you can see various insects rehydrating from the extra floral nectaries of sunflowers. Reproductive diapause can also be important. Our native lady beetles tend to remain non-reproductive for extended periods in summer, which re reducing their activity, heat exposure, and food requirements. Other species are capable of estivation, a kind of summer version of hibernation in which they remain dormant in sheltered, cool locations, which greatly reduces their food requirements. Once temperatures cool off in autumn, they can once again become active, and in the case of lady beetles, have another generation before winter starts. In combination with high winds, as we often do in central Kansas, there can be direct physical damage to crops, especially when they are in reproductive stages. So here you can see some infertility and sorghum panicles induced by heat blast, and heads of sunflower with brack necrosis, which is also called, caused by heat scorch. These flowers will never expand or fill seed properly. In hot summer weather, we tend to worry about drought, but heat alone can be very harmful. Heat stress can reduce plant pro productivity substantially, independent of drought stress, because at high temperatures, photosynthesis will shut down. That is why even irrigated corn can fail in really hot summers. Now, photosynthesis can continue at somewhat higher temperatures at C4 plants, like sorghum, which is why these work better for us in hot weather. 
but only to a point. And then we have heat-loving pests that benefit from high temperatures both directly and indirectly because their rate of reproduction increases at the same time predation pressure on them is reduced due to thermal impacts on their natural enemies. And all this happens while plants are stressed and must, must less able to compensate for feeding damage. What this means is that the economic lingerie level is essentially much lower under conditions that favor the pest and disadvantage the plant. So it takes fewer insects feeding to cause economic injury. And the economic injury level is reached much earlier in cases where insects are actively reproducing in the crop. In really hot weather, we get a situation where plants are unable to grow and compensate for lost tissues. And yet insects and mites continue to feed and their damage rapidly accumulates. We can see this effect with thrips and spider mites on drought-stressed soybean, uh, as these are pests that thrive in warm weather. A pest density that would normally be non-economic then has the potential to kill plants, and the high temperatures accelerate their development and reproduction to make matters worse. Note how the thrips damage tends to be concentrated along the leaf veins where the thrips like to hang out, whereas the mite damage is the opposite. Here is a similar situation with spider mites in corn. There are always some spider mites in corn, but when drought and high temperatures converge to disadvantage the plants and benefit mite reproduction at the same time, this is what you get. We can see a similar effect in winter wheat when dry weather favors brown wheat mite populations in spring, although in this case it is a problem exacerbated more by drought than by temperature. In a dry spring, wheat plants are unable to outgrow mite damage that would normally be insignificant. The damage accumulates quickly and whole fields can be killed. In autumn, once again, changes in temperature trigger changes in insect behavior and physiology as migratory species prepare for migration to the south and resident species prepare to overwinter in place. But now a different environmental cue comes into play that also interacts with temperature, day length. Just as photosensitive plants measure the length of the night to know what time of year it is and whether to flower or not, so many insects use day length to know when it is time to prepare for winter. Although responses to day length by insects can occur independent of temperature, they are usually stronger when accompanied by lower temperatures. Even the larvae of parasitoids are able to measure day length while they are still within their hosts, so they know how to, they know to prepare for hibernation within the host mummy rather than emerging immediately. And we have subtropical pests such as the sugarcane aphid, which change their phenotype quite dramatically as temperatures fall, reproducing more slowly while becoming more and more cold tolerant as they try to survive in a state of low activity on the remnants of their host plants, such as re-sprouting re sorghum stubble. Now they can't do this in Kansas, but this is how they survive in Texas. In contrast, many temperate aphid species such as bird chariot aphid respond to cooler weather and shorter days by producing sexual forms that lay overwintering eggs that can survive freezing temperatures. You can see the interaction of temperature and day length in this study of diapause and oriental armyworm. At a low temperature of 16 degrees centigrade, you'll get almost 100% of these larvae enter diapause and uh, they uh, form hibernating cocoons uh, if they're at 16 degrees centigrade. But if you raise the temperature up to 20 degrees centigrade, you see fewer and fewer of these insects respond to shorter days with the appropriate diapause behavior. So what can we expect with climate change? Well, the nature of insect problems will change in some ways that are predictable and others that aren't. Short warmer winters mean that many insect pests will emerge earlier and potentially have more generations per year which could lead to higher peak populations late in the growing season, 
for insects such as false chinch bug that already have multiple generations a year. Tropical pests will expand their range northward as temperature conditions become more amenable to them. Many aphid species may forego sexuality entirely and continue to reproduce sexually year-round at higher latitudes than they normally have. This is already resulting in earlier and more widespread transmission of viruses in grain crops in northern Europe, where the bird cherry oat aphid now forgoes sexual reproduction completely as far north as Poland. The various negative effects of high temperatures on plants and their ability to tolerate insect feeding will get worse. Higher summer, temper higher summer temperatures could reduce the eff efficacy of many natural enemies whose foraging activities could be curtailed, reducing their pest control services. Predicted changes in the path of the jet stream are expected to permit migratory pests to arrive earlier and penetrate further into northern latitudes. Generally greater unpredictability of weather patterns will make pest management and farming in general more challenging. So we need to be prepared for these eventualities. With that, I will take any questions. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us online for our 2020 virtual field day. My name is Augustine Obo. I'm the soil scientist here at agri Center in Hayes. Today, I'll be talking to you about some of our cover crop research that we've been doing in Western Kansas, looking at our dual use of cover crops uh, for soil health and also for forage uh, management. One thing we all know is cover crops are something that are becoming popular now. It provides a lot of benefits, which include providing soil cover, which is very important in our environment because if we have cover, then we are able to reduce wind erosion and also erosion through water. And then we are also able to build up the soil structure, improve soil organic matter content, which all help to improve soil water infiltration, which is a pretty good thing in our dryland environment. However, cover crops, like any other crop, uses water. So when we grow cover crop ahead of a cash crop, we tend to have decreasing yields, especially in dry years. So how do we take advantage of cover crops to improve our soil? One option is to use this cover crop for forage. So that is what we have been doing since 2015. We are looking at different management strategies where we can use these cover crops for forage. Either we graze the cover crop or hay it as a, as a hay crop and then grow a subsequent crop after the cover crop. What we are trying to do is utilizing the cover crop for forage to see if we can get any economic benefit from the cover crop. And if we do so, if we get a decrease in yield, then we get some economic benefit to compensate for the yield loss. So the objective of this research uh, is to determine the forage production potential of these cover crops that we grow. And then looking at uh, when you grow this cover crop, what will be the impact on subsequent crop yields. And then when you remove the cover crop, that is the third objective. When you remove the cover crop, what will be the impact on soil health? So we started looking at growing this cover crop at different uh, fallow phases of the wheat sorghum fallow rotation. So we grow the cover crop into sorghum stubble in the spring or corn stubble in the spring. That will be a spring planted cover crop. Or we can grow the cover crop post wheat. So growing the cover crop, that is a summer cover crop after wheat harvest. Or we can plant the cover crop in the fall. So that is what we are doing. We have size all the way from Marquette, Kansas. We have a site in Alexander, Kansas. We have a site at our KSU HB Ranch, which is near Brownell, Kansas. And we have a site in Hayes. And we have a site also in Higotin and then Garden City. Today, we are standing here in the cover crop on-farm production field where we have our demonstration of summer cover crops. This is a site that we are collaborating with any binder, a producer here in Hayes. So here, any planted uh, these cover crops into uh, triticale stubble. So these cover crops were planted the first week in June. So this summer cover crop mix is made up of uh, Sudan grass. This is Sudan grass. We have um, German millet. Uh, we also have sun hemp. And then there was also uh, sunflowers in the mix. 
we have a sunflower and then we also have radishes and then uh, rapeseed in the cover crop mix so he did this in 2019 and this is a, a second year of doing this cover crop here any is grazing this cover crop so you will see that this has been grazed he put cattle in about two weeks ago we still have cows that are grazing the cover crop on that side of the field so these cover crops are being grazed so what we do is after uh, he grazed the cover crops he's going to plant the field back into uh, sorghum sudan grass so one thing that we have noticed is our cover crop the productivity varies from year to year but in general, our summer cover crops produce more biomass than our cool season cover crops. So our summer cover crops are averaging about um, 6,000 to 7,000 pounds per acre. And then our spring planted cover crops ranges from 1,600 pounds per acre. That is this year was very dry. We have about 1,600 pounds per acre to about 3,200 pounds that we got in 2015 and then 2017. So one other issue that we have with cover crops is uh, when you graze the cover crop, there is concern that uh, you may be able, you'll be removing more biomass, so you'll be losing your soil health benefits. So what we are doing is uh, in our cover crops, uh, there's a lot of uh, regrowth potential too, especially in our spring cover crops. I think I have some data here that shows that our spring planted cover crops, we have significant amount of regrowth that most times uh, when we start grazing for example in market in 2020 when we started grazing the cover crop we had about thousand pounds per acre at the time of grazing and then by the time we terminated the cover crop in April we actually had two thousand pounds per acre so that is twice the amount of biomass so that means you can still graze it and not lose your uh, soil health uh, cover uh, from the cover crop and then from our summer cover crop which don't ha normally have significant uh, regrowth but still we are seeing enough regrowth here in 2019 this cover crop particular mix we have about 6,500 pounds at the time of uh, grazing and then by the time uh, that we terminated the cover crop we actually had about 4,500 pounds so Post grazing was 4,500 pounds. So we still have enough residue to cover the soil. All right, so you can see that we have significant amount of biomass here. He grazed this about two weeks ago and we still have quite a bit of biomass. So he will come in again and graze for another uh, week or so and then he will take the cattle out. And then this is going to be frost kill. So he's not going to terminate this with herbicide. Um, last year, he started grazing uh, these cover crops around August 24th, and then he uh, moved the cattle out on August, uh, sorry, September 10th. So he had about 48 days of grazing, and here he had he uses cow calf pairs. So he wasn't looking for um, uh, daily gains gains on on the cattle. So he didn't get any gains, but he had 48 days of grazing. Compare this with our um, spring cover crops that we had in Alexander, Kansas. Those were uh, planted in late March, and then the producer started grazing them on uh, May 14th, and then he took the cattle off on June 15th. He had about 31 days of grazing. There he has some gain in weight. We have an average daily gain of about 3.1 pounds uh, per day. So that is pretty good. And the forage quality of this cover crop is also very high. The spring cover crop, the crude protein, for example, ranges from about 19 to 26%. And our summer cover crop, the protein concentration is around uh, 7%. So we will go to the next site where I will show you where any planted the summer cover crops last year and what we have growing on that site at the moment. Yeah, before we head out to the other side, I would like to point out uh, something about weeds very quick. Uh, cover crops also provide significant weed benefit. As you can see here, there are no weeds in this uh, cover crops. Uh, it's very clean. It's all, everything is the cover crop. Either it's a sun ham, or, um, either it's sun ham or millet or sudan grass or sunflowers. There is no weeds here. 
and this is a pretty good uh, advantage with cover crop you are able to suppress weeds like palmer amaranth without this cover crop there will be a lot of palmer amaranth in this uh, field so this is pretty good and then one thing that I observe quickly, you see this, uh, this sun hemp is starting to regrow after grazing. So there's a lot of uh, potential for these cover crops to regrow, not even the grass, only the grasses, but even the legume, the sun hemp in this, is uh, started having some regrowth to it. So we will head back to the site where we planted the cover crops last year. Sunflower and this is sun hemp. All right, so as promised, uh, this is the site that we had the cover crop last year. Um, this uh, site after the cover crop were terminated by frost in October last year. The plants were planted to uh, forest sorghum uh, this summer. And this is how it looks like. So see how tall it is? It's really, really tall. It's doing very well. And he applied only 50 pounds of N here. So our cover crops actually had no impact had no effect on our subsequent forest sorghum yields. One other thing that we talk about when we graze cover crops is uh, the issue of soil compaction. So we took soil samples to measure bulk density. We did not see any significant difference between where we grazed the cover crops and where we left it as a strictly uh, cover crop that we didn't graze it. So cover crop had no impact on soil bulk density. And we've been doing this for the past five years, even our at our HB ranch, we are not seeing any significant impact on uh, soil compaction with grazing of the cover crops. So we also took soil samples and measured soil organic matter content. What we are seeing is we are seeing some uh, interesting results. We've seen a little bit of an increase in soil organic matter content with the uh, cover crops that we've been planting for the past five years. One interesting thing that we are seeing though is the subsurface soil organic matter content. So below six inches, we are seeing actually the cover crop treatments are increasing the soil organic matter content more than where we had followed. So this is pretty cool that we are seeing an increase uh, even where we graze the cover crops, the subsurface soil organic carbon content is greater than uh, the fallow treatments. Then we are also seeing a significant increase in aggregate stability uh, with uh, soil uh, cover crops. So the cover crops treatments, whether we graze the cover crops or we left it as a true cover or we hid the cover crop, the aggregate stability is significantly greater than where we had as follow. So what this means is that our cover crops are improving uh, the soil structure. And what is more important also is uh, even though we are grazing the cover crops, we are not seeing any difference between the true cover crop, which was no graze, versus where we hate or we graze in terms of uh, soil structure, aggregate stability. So this is very good news for producers that are grazing or looking at grazing cover crops in dry land systems. So in conclusion, uh, for the past five years, for the past five years that we've been doing this, we see that most of our cover crop species are good forage producers. They can give high uh, quality forage uh, for livestock. And when we do graze these cover crops, we are seeing actually an increase in soil structure with the cover crop. We are not seeing any detrimental effects so far as uh, soil bog density is concerned. And we are also seeing that actually infiltration is greater where we had a cover crop versus where we had as true fallow. So this is all I have for you. If you want more information, you can email me or call me at our research station. I'll be happy to share with you some of the results that we've gathered uh, over the five, past five years on using cover crops for soil health and also using them for forage uh, production. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to K-State Ag Research Center Hayes, uh, which will field today. Uh, I'm happy to join with you. Hope you all guys are all doing great in this pandemic situation. I'm Ram Permal, sorghum breeder. 
focusing my research on uh, developing parent alliances uh, for drought and uh, cold tolerance and we are not only developing parent alliances recently our focus is on developing some good hybrids for the uh, need of the western cancers uh, sorghum growers what you are seeing here is uh, different sorghum hybrids with a different maturity normally this is the time we go for uh, seeing the data collection uh, this was planted in june that is the normal planting western cancers growers go for uh, planting uh, between end of may and first week of june that is the normal planting uh, this experiment was uh, planted in june first what you are seeing here is uh, different maturity on your uh, right you can focus this side and these hybrids are with different maturity come to 60 days 65 days 70 days to flowering that means we are looking for several traits what for this is hybrid selection is one of the important criteria to get maximum yield normally we are facing severe drought during post flowering time because of limited rainfall annual rainfall is not good enough to get good hybrid yield potential the hybrids we are focusing on several traits the hybrids with the good standability and with the maturity normally in western cancers we go for a early maturing group because uh, it comes to harvesting that is combined harvesting close to second week of uh, october that is uh, is uh, taking the risk of facing the first freeze normally it comes first week of october so this it is takes that kind of risk avoiding that uh, first freezing uh, harvesting time uh, limited uh, harvesting hours these are all some challenges growers are facing here the heads with the different flowering dates it's meant for getting high yield potential we have several hybrids developed at this center and we have included several uh, commercial hybrids also with the different maturity that you are going to see now the hybrids what we are looking is not only the uh, high yield potential the height height is it should be around this much height is good enough otherwise in the later part post flowering stress associated with uh, um, lodging due to stock rot secondary infection that is one of the diseases so the stock strength is very very important and the head size and the panicle exertion you see the head is completely exerted from the boot leaf and the good compact to semi compact head these are all the criteria and you, you see the um, green leaf that is stay green these are all the traits we are looking for developing high yielding hybrids besides the head size and large heads long heads you can see the long large heads here here easily you can get a uh, per head 2000 to 3000 kernels per head that is what growers need you can see the stock stiffness it's with the good stock strength we we are confident that this won't go for large even if it faces the post flowering stress another thing you can see the head size is semi compact so growers are in need of the seed color seed color red to white seeded hybrids that that is not the big preference either red seeded or white seeded both are they are preferred and but the same time the number of kernels seed weight and the number of plant stand and are the deciding factors for the high yield potential and this year we got good rainfall unlike in previous years last average rainfall in july is 3 inches this year we got 6 inches so that means i didn't see much difference in the dryland experiments and in the irrigated experiments so what a good news happy news growers can expect at least 150 to 200 bushels per acre this year that is the good yield year i think hopefully uh, another uh, challenging thing few years uh, before we are facing uh, the sorkin efits that is uh, is uh, totally under control this year only in certain pockets of the great bend a little bit that is all under control either as a savanto or uh, transform pesticides they are using for that 
and the savanta is better than that the other uh, pesticide because of the longer control period so it is a bit expensive but by considering these things these are uh, we are expecting several good hybrids now so the regular planting you can see different hybrids this is flowering is completed that means the flowering days are 60 days from planting and this one is just uh, in the flowering process it starts from the beginning and it takes another three or four days to complete flowering and this hybrid what you are seeing in the middle is in the stage of flowering stage completing stage so all hybrids has got its own unique characters if you see these heads it's all large heads but if you see these two hybrids you can see the uniformity all hybrids are pretty much 100% uniform but in addition each one has different unique characters with more number of tillers and the head shape number of kernels these all will be decided only after the uh, harvesting so we are seeing several hybrids we developed all hybrids and it's all under comparison and we included hybrids this is also one of the hybrids we developed here you see the head length it is close to more than one foot that means it easily comes up with 2000 to 3000 kernels so the, you can see the robustness of this head and this is also about to be in a closing stage of the flowering and uh, several other commercial hybrids what you are seeing here this is four rows each hybrids this hybrid is one of the hybrids from the chromatin that is SNW company another hybrid you can see a little bit earlier hybrid but the earlier is means you cannot expect the potential yield potential if you want to see the potential yield the maturity period should be a little bit longer that full growing season hybrids so different maturity gives different advantages and some disadvantages it's all depends upon the growers preference and region specific recommendation of the hybrids and these another two hybrids you can see this is also different maturity it's all already flowering is over though all are planted on the same day june first you can see the different uh, flowering time this hybrid obviously it gives better yield than the earlier maturing hybrid though it looks very attractive at the time of harvest it will excel the yield performance and you can see another two hybrids these two hybrids we received it from texas a &M university a &M university is one of the other big breeding programs and uh, uh, they are also in the stage of developing many advanced hybrids Kansas State and the Texas A&M University we strongly established, established a collaboration and we are uh, exchanging our materials to develop new combinations of hybrids for the benefit of the growers. So hybrid 1 and hybrid 2 you can see the uniformity now flowering is over it started early grain filling stage that is milking stage. So in this stage then it goes to next stage of grain maturity. So during this time, hopefully we may not face any stress that is post flowering stress and we may end up with the good yield potential this year. Thank you. We are in the another sorghum field uh, we planted in uh, April 27. That is yearly planting. That's what we are aiming for developing new hybrids uh, for yearly planting. Yearly planting means uh, we planted in April 27. Normal planting is end of May or June first week so at least a month before we are going for early planting to optimize this planting date we did several experiments since last three years uh, starting with April 1st April 7 April 15 April 21st April 28 like that uh, till May 15 several weekly plantings we conducted those experiments same hybrids same parental lines we evaluated and we came to know end of april or first week of may is the best time for early planting because in the early planting of the same hybrids in the first week or second week of april the average germination germination percentage was percentage was 48 percent but the same hybrids when we were evaluating in end of april 
our first week of May, the average germination percentage was 75%. We could see the differences. We optimized. So, seedling vigor, germination percentage are most challenging characters. These triads we optimized and we developed several parental lines for chilling tolerance because in April the soil temperature would be around 55. The germination percentage would be very poor. So, but with that challenges we identified some potential parental lines and we transferred that character into our breeding materials and we are in the stage of developing many advanced breeding lines going for developing new hybrids for early planting. These early planting hybrids you can see right now it's all in close to maturity stage. That means we can go for harvesting uh, probably in the first week of September. That is at least a month before we can go for early harvesting. This helps a lot. Then you may ask this question, what for this early planting? Because regular planting we are facing several challenges, early freeze in October and uh, long cutting hours by using the combined harvest. When you go for early planting, in the end of April and May, we can avail the existing soil moisture. So we don't have to face any pre-flowering stress and also the plant stand in the middle of May, it helps to minimize the weeds competition. Uh, when we discuss with our uh, weed scientist, the palmer uh, start germinating in the middle of May. By the time when this hybrid is planted in early, uh, sorry, end of uh, April or early May, it covers the, the canopy covers the ground and it helps to minimize the weeds population. That is one of the major good advantages. But still we are working on uh, that kind of optimizing that uh, weeds population minimization with the help of the weed scientist. Also, the, even though we are going for uh, early planting in April 27 or first week of May, the challenges is still the germination percentage. We are getting only 75% germination. So normal planting, even with the commercial hybrids, we can easily get more than 85% seed germination and good plant stand. So what other things, challenges, what we are facing is to compensate that 70% germination, we need to go with more seed rate and the spacing trials. We are working with the other production agronomist to optimize that level also. So normally uh, Kansas growers go for uh, 4 pounds per acre seed rate. That means uh, close to 55,000 to 60,000 seeds per acre. But when we go for yearly planting, we recommend at least 70,000 seeds. So that the 70% germination, the remaining 30% non-germination can be compensated by increasing the seed rate. That means instead of 4 pounds, we recommend 5 to 6 pounds. That means more seed rate automatically it fills the gap and we will get the normal yield what we are getting in the regular planting. So these are all the advantages associated with the yearly planting stuff. So earlier period the grains are with high tanning, the sources for chilling tolerance. But in our breeding program, since uh, last uh, our continuous efforts, we ended up with uh, several new breeding lines with non-tannin. So that is the advantages. And the earlier sources were high tannin and with poor agronomic traits performance. That means very tall, poor exertion, poor uh, panicle size we are looking for, recommending for, uh, looking and recommending for uh, Western Kansas growers so that we don't have to face uh, all drought related stresses and the lodging problem or stock rot issues or everything and uh, long cutting hours we can avoid uh, early freeze and uh, everything will be done by the uh, middle of September. Yeah, now I explained about both regular planting and early planting. Regular planting is end of May to June first week, early planting is end of April to first week of May. So I highlighted all the advantages 
uh, what uh, growers can get benefit out of going for early planting so i am happy to answer your questions feel free to uh, interact with me thanks for the opportunity